fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren on KCC 106.5 FM Los Angeles 102.3 FM Riverside and 105.0 AM Palm Springs Welcome back into the House of Mystery I'm Al Warren Mr. John Copenhaver is there How are you doing John? I'm doing well How are you doing Al? I'm delicious. Oh, great. That's a very good thing to be right before Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah, delicious. Spread on bread. No, actually, you know, um, I'm not doing Thanksgiving. Oh, no. No, I'm up in the Kanakistan. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I've got a turkey, but I'm not going to do it. I'm I'm just too tired. Yeah, it's kind of an ordeal. We do it. Well, I mean, if I'm being honest, my husband really does it, and I just eat clean up. <laughs> Which means you throw away the paper plates. Uh, well, sometimes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Truth comes out. And, of course, you can't wear white because it's after Labor Day. <laughs> In- indeed. <laughs> I, was, I, I, just, I, I was just told that the other day, and I, I didn't realize that was still a thing, and people still said it. Yeah, you know, I get conscious about wearing white after Labor Day. Like, not a white shirt, but, like, really, like, you know, white pants. Or not that I have a lot of white pants, but, you know. Yeah, I think it's part of the gay gene, right? Yeah, we're just like, we're we very much, we're very observant of Labor Day. <laughs> yeah, you don't need a calendar. All of a sudden, it's, oh, it's Labor Day. Oh, no more white. <laughs> Start packing it away without even thinking. I know it happens all the time. Well, anyway, spe- speaking of of uh, white and labor day we're gonna go <laughs> we're gonna go on to a writer we've got a writer another friend of yours i guess now this one uh and the book here we're we're gonna focus on is called the quarry girls and it's a thriller so hold on to your seat this is a this is a thriller and the author is here jess Lowry. thank you for being here thank you for having me so if you are delicious i am spicy <laughs> and we know John's sweet. Yeah, oh. ex- yeah. See, so <laughs> sweet. Yeah, this sounds like sweet and sour pork. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's I'm going to get in trouble for that, but that's okay. Jess, it's uh, really good to meet you. So, um, hey, you've been writing for quite a while, or is this or is this fairly new for you? My first book came out in 2006, and The Quarry Girls is, I think, my 20th. Third, so I have been doing it for a while, but I've just been doing it full time for a little over a year. Wow, that's quite a quite a twenty six in. Uh, well, it's been a few years, I guess. Hey, that's still right. We're not going to no, match I just that one, but it's been a few yeah. years. Still, yeah. I, that's impressive. I'm I'm such a slow writer. I just yeah, I, I couldn't imagine that. You know, I think uh, I think slow is better in most things. For me, I think it's a little bit of. Uh, uh, a little bit of a, I don't want to say addiction because that's too strong of a word, but I get so much of my mental health from writing that I just sort of, I just slam it. I'm much the same. I'm I'm on do, writing book twenty nine and thirty right now. Congratulations. Well, I I don't I don't think of it that way. I just think it's work to me. <laughs> yeah. But it's yeah. it's like you. I need to do it. Mm-hmm. If yeah, I'm right. not I doing mean, it, it's well, crazy. Bet- I bet, John, is it the same for you? I mean, so you're a slow writer, but do you also feel um, like you're missing something when you're not writing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I I, I go a little nuts. I get grumpy and unpleasant to be around. Um, You know, I just, I I don't, yeah. I mean, it's funny you were saying that it's a big part of your mental health, and I feel like, uh, yes, and it's actually a big reason for my mental health to not be so good at times. It's true. (laughs) <laughs> but you know, I think it's mainly the the flip side of it. It's the the external part of the book world, not the actual sitting down to write it. I think that is for me therapeutic in in ways that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. I, it, the the um, publishing part of the book is uh, of a book is never the the best part for me. If I can avoid it as much as possible, I I do. You know, like the editing process we have to go through and all that. But uh, it's not my favorite. Mm hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense. And I, and even though I love writing, I also hate writing. I just, it's like pushing water uphill. But when I'm done with it, it's the every day. It's the best feeling. Yeah, and I can relate to that. But then I wonder if you, do you also have um, an emotional connection with this writing, uh, uh, the writing itself? Uh, it doesn't matter what you're writing, and and I mean this in the sense that. Um, you have to be connected and in the right frame of mind in order to be doing it. Uh, or can you just do it without, without that? I can't. And in fact, I, ha I have a TEDx talk about, uh, about how I write and I take, I take a bit of trauma or, or some area that I'm trying to evolve in and I put it into the main character of every book I write. And so it becomes a very, um, personal journey, which makes it, I think, more rewarding, but also just really hard. And then especially when, and it's true, I think, of any book, but when you put yourself consciously into the characters, when you put it out into the world and anybody with a Kindle can download it and tell you what they, <laughs> tell you what they think of it, it becomes, it becomes a fun game. Well, I was going to say that's a very vulnerable position to be in with a lot of people you don't know. Um, what gives you that kind of courage? You know, I don't know that it's courage. I think it's really a, as a result of growing up in a very stifling, very unsafe Midwestern home and community where people just didn't talk about stuff. And so I have all of this pent up um, need to tell stories. And I'm not a very good oral storyteller at all. I think that's a gift. I love people who can tell a story well in person. But if you give me time alone in front of a computer and I can craft the words how I want them, how I want them to show up, it becomes it becomes something really important to me, even if I don't get it right. And I don't very often get it perfect, but it becomes a way uh, to connect with people, honestly. Well, the connections probably will be more important than getting it perfect. Yeah, right. And, and even what would that mean? What does that mean? mean to get it perfect with writing when you're when you've got 80 to 90 thousand words i don't even know what that would look like yeah i mean i actually i have this conversation with myself a lot i have no idea why i think i'm trying to achieve like some uh goal in my mind with i mean i'm talking about sentence level stuff i'm like stop stop john just write <laughs> yeah and um and it is i think it's a problem but it's not a problem that i'm necessarily solved for myself if that makes yeah sense. maybe that comes in time i think that um when i first started writing and getting published that was very important to me i wanted everything to be as good as possible and that's why i went through publishers too um, i want it to be beaten by editors and and railed <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a different, sorry. I'm talking about a different story. No, I want it to get. I I really want it to go through the. Well, I want it the abuse. I want it to be. I want yeah. it to learn. It was my way of learning, so to speak. Yeah. You know what I mean. I want it to be carried. You know, held to task. This is wrong. This is wrong. Do it this way. Do it. You know. And I want it to go through all the hard stuff. Um. And now when I'm writing, I I care so much less about that than I used to. Uh, I mean, I want it to come out correct, and I want it to be edited properly and all that stuff, but it's not as much a focus anymore. It's moved down on the list. Well, and I wonder how much, because it sounds like you sought out really good editing, really strong feedback, I wonder how much of it is you've internalized a lot of that, so you just don't need it as much anymore. It's part of how you write. Yeah, I think it's a combination deal. Um, I think I find that I can do better now when I look at things and as I write things. Sometimes I, I think, wow, geez, I can do that. And yeah. um, whereas I didn't have that confidence 10 years ago, let's say. Um, yeah, and I did. Actually, I found an excellent editor that worked for two different publishers, 
and I use her all the time, no matter what publisher I'm sending it to, no matter who gets it. I I go through her personally and pay her to uh, work with me on every book I do now. So I've done the same for 23 books, the same woman. What's the name of your woman? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been had. Same person. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, mine's Kat, Kat, Kat okay. McCarthy. Okay, mine's Jessica Morell. Okay, so they're, unless they've got dual names, no. No, and I found it, it's really important because if you connect with an editor, it's amazing how it works, and yeah. they get to know kind of the trope, kind of the things you do and the things you don't do. And, and, um, it's kind of, I think it's great. I think, I think we've done amazing work together over 20 books, I would say. And, um, and I'll keep doing it as long as she keeps doing what she does. So. Yeah. Those relationships, you know, writer, editor relationships, if you find one that's, it's gold, I think. Yeah. 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 Because I've been through some of the bigger publishers I worked for were I didn't have the best relationship with some of the editors. Um, I think coming from um, being on the spectrum and working through all of my own issues, sometimes editors don't have the patience, especially when I was doing The Killing Game, and that book did really well. But they, they were really... Um, they weren't the most pleasant editors to work with. So mm. that was, that was a rough, that was the roughest goal, the roughest thing I've ever had, had gone through. And it's one of the most popular books I've ever done. So. So did you just have to stand your ground or was it more about finding compromise with, with that book? I tried standing my ground, but I was too new. I think that was only, yeah. that was only my second or third book published and I didn't feel confident and um the other thing is um i didn't feel right mm. i think that was a lot of it too cuz you don't like when when you've got professional editors telling you one thing it's hard to to you know say that oh you're wrong i'm right mm-hmm. i don't know i guess you can say it, say it but it's hard to believe it let's just say it was for me I mean, they'll right. listen to you right you know i mean even if you speak up you know, who's going to who's going to win the battle yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I spoke up a lot and I did cause quite a few waves in that publishing house. And I don't think, I don't think they'll ever work with me again. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was a successful book and, and things went, turned out all really, really well at the end. But it was one of the hardest processes I've, I've ever been through. Um, hmm. I think that, I think that the thing is they didn't realize they, they really, they really hurt my feelings. Um, not so much from correcting me, but from the way that they were doing it. Oh, you know, that's an art as an editor. I don't, I think that'd be a very difficult to tell somebody what they're doing wrong without hurting their feelings. Well, even as an English teacher, John, so you and I have both, I, I am no longer doing it, but you and I have both been teachers and it's really hard to, to criticize somebody's writing without crushing their dream. Right. <laughs> yeah, you do have to become a, a a very you know gentle um and couch things with compliments and that kind of thing. Um, and you know, I mean, ultimately, I think if you're an editor and your goal is to get the writer or student um, or teacher to hear you, you can't just slam them with hard, like, blunt advice, because often, unless they're just used to that kind of feedback, they're not going to hear you. Mm-hmm. So a lot of wasted energy. So, um, yeah, with my students, I think you definitely have to find a way in to get them to hear you. Um, you know, if you care about seeing them grow, which is I'm not sure why you would teach if you didn't, but right. <laughs> there are those teachers, but I don't understand those teachers. But uh, <laughs> You write about this. Um, this is a coming of age fiction. So when, when I see that, I think so. And you talk about how you put a lot of yourself into the main character. So I'm imagining that this book is about some childhood trauma you had. Yeah, with the, so with the Corey girls, and I, 
the, my last four books with Thomas and Mercer have been inspired by true crimes in Minnesota, and so which is where I'm based. And so with uh, the Quarry Girls, it's set in St. Cloud, Minnesota, which is a quarry town in the center of Minnesota, uh, population 60,000 or so. And when I was growing up there in the 70s, there were two and maybe three serial killers operating. And it was I was I was a very young child, and I have this distinct memory of being four years old and going to play. Just it's the 70s. It sounds so weird now, but just in the 70s, we just would go play as very young children. And my parents were pretty much drunk or high most of the 70s. And again, they weren't alone in that. But (laughs) it was I was out playing and I decided to go to the grocery store because if I'm sitting outside the grocery store, I figured somebody would give me candy. It's not a straight line of logic, but it was it was all it was all I had. So I'm standing out in front of Coburn's in St. Cloud, Minnesota in 1974, and a police car pulls up and they ask me to get into the back of the car. And at the time, like, and and still to this day, obviously, you don't get into a stranger's car, but they finally talked me into it, brought me home and said uh, two girls had just been kidnapped and kids can't be walking around at night anymore alone. And so nobody really talked about it other than that. It was just we couldn't play outside anymore without an adult. And it became this care blanket that was just over everything. And so my book, The Quarry Girls, is about it's fictionalized, but it's about those two, maybe three serial killers in the 70s and what it was like to grow up with them hunting around you in the neighborhood I lived in, which was set over tunnels. So it was an old, uh, it was an old abandoned car factory set over tunnels. And so it became this very metaphorical, but also terrifying childhood location. And that's, that's what I wrote about for the Quarry Girls. Wow. So each time you do that, I guess that's, um, Again, you're putting you when you do that, when you're so involved in 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 the story and it's so personal to you, are you a fiction writer that creates characters that you become very intimate with? <laughs> I mean this in a sense of <laughs> do you hear the voice? Do you feel them? Do you get, you know, because I've I talked to a lot of fiction writers and uh, a lot of fiction writers will come and they'll start describing their characters as their children. Or their, mm-hmm. you know, their family, and and they they see them in their head. They hear their voices at night. You know, things like this. They they hear they hear the conversations. Is it that way for you too, or is it completely different? It's not that way for me. I think that would be kind of terrifying. I do too. <laughs> I, I write true crime, and I hear them say this, and I think, oh my god, do you wake up with a shovel in your hand in the middle of the night? <laughs> <laughs> I, d- I don't hear their voices. Um, I don't, I do get intimate with them. I'm not, yeah, I'm never single. I've always got my books, but <laughs> <laughs> well, I, do, I do get intimate with them in, in the way that I think most writers do, which is when I'm in the midst of writing a novel, even when I'm not writing it, when I'm out in the world, I'm, I'm thinking of storylines, I'm thinking of plot twists, I'm thinking of bits of dialogue that I could work in. Um, every now and again, I will have dreams about uh usually it's a plot not k-o-n-t working itself out i'll have some dream along those lines but they are very separate they're very separate from me i'm just working through some um evolution i'm just working through some personal issue which i think we all do a little bit in our writing right i mean we're writing about things that are interesting to us (laughs) yeah i'm writing about murder there you go (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm, I'm working it out, you know, <laughs> in my books. When you talk about the, like you're talking about the Cory Girls, you're talking about the, um, the storyline. Um, what, what is it that you think leads you into a story? Yeah, I mean, with with this one, it was a contract. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, oh, you're silly. No, but if what I'm... what leads you into the? particular story not the deal <laughs> not the yeah it's a two book deal I'm right ta- i'm talking like as in why the quarry girls why not there's a lot of bad things that happen in minnesota um yeah. and, and especially um through the years and i'm sure that there's a lot of stories you heard over the years and have come across that you could write about or center right. your story on is there something particular about certain stories that um, clicks with you? 
With the Quarry Girls, it was my publisher wanted another true crime inspired uh, novel, and so I knew I knew I would be looking for that. And then I like to have a personal connection to it, so I was searching in my past. So Unspeakable Things, which was my breakout book uh, four books ago, was set in my hometown where we moved after St. Cloud of Painesville, Minnesota, and and the name is too on the nose. It Painesville. It was just it was just a really <laughs> terrifying place to grow up. And when I was researching Unspeakable Things, which was about uh, a period in the eighties when seven seven young boys were were abused and returned, and then the eighth one was abused and never returned. And it was in my hometown. When I was writing about that, I stumbled across a podcast called In the Dark. Have you listened to oh, it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's great. It's so good. And the whole first season is about that case in Painesville. And so I'd already written half the book when I found the podcast. And I listened to it, and it just talked about it, it talked about everything. It was so well-researched. But maybe the eighth or ninth episode talked about this raft of crimes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that the Stearns County Police either messed up on or just sort of looked away from. And one of them was the 1974 case of the Reeker sisters in St. Cloud who were abducted on Labor Day, speaking of wearing white, and they they were they disappeared for a month and for the first couple of weeks the police said they probably ran away it was two young girls and they just said they probably ran away and the mother and father plastered the town with uh with flyers they tried to get everybody involved and unfortunately the girls were found a month later in the in, excuse me in the quarries and so i knew that was a story i wanted to revisit uh because i was just so connected to it it, obviously in a very in a very peripheral way, but so connected to my childhood that I wanted to I wanted to come back to that story. I wanted to find justice and, and to figure out what that looks like when the murder has never been found and when the parents have never been able to close that chapter. And so I really wanted to explore I just knew I really wanted to explore what, what justice can look like when the when the laws aren't supporting you. I don't know if there's really any justice even when they get caught. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, right? I, it doesn't you know, bring it doesn't bring anybody back. I well, I just don't I don't understand when people talk about this this illusion of justice for anybody involved in in any of these um, horrid crimes that you, I, I've been through so many of them and I don't see it yeah. ever as justice, even if the person gets caught and killed that did it. Yeah. I don't know. I just don't feel there's any weight to that word. I think it's something we we use to try to fill a hole that um you know, to move on with our life as it's changed, you know. I, I don't fair. know. You know, it's just um what do you, what do you hope people take away from a book like this? Like when you go into it and it's so important to you and other than the the few that will get on and on you know Amazon or Goodreads and say I don't know this woman doesn't know how to write. Other, yeah. <laughs> other than that one or two, um, what is it that you hope someone takes away? With the Quarry Girls, it very specifically was important to me that what people take away is the power of talking about trauma. And so, if we don't keep the secret, if we don't carry the water for the system or the people who are hurting others, y you can. I agree with you, uh, what you said about justice, but you can find some strength or you can at least make sure that the next generation or the people one, one out from your circle aren't hurt as bad. And so I really wanted people to take away the idea that, that we need to tell these stories. We need to talk about it. We need to not take other people's behavior as our shame. And it's, the book has been really well received and I'm, I'm humbled by it because when I read reviews, which I just did the first couple of days the book came out, people were getting it. People were understanding what I was trying to do with that one. So in a way, justice is about how we carry on. How we make, right, how you build back a life or how you how you break down oppressive systems. I think there's something there. I I think we're teasing at it. I don't know exactly what it is. I, it's something I continue to look for. Let me know yeah. when you find it. Yeah. <laughs> I will, I'll email you. Yeah. <laughs> Send me an email. Snapchat me when you figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do a big Snapchat. Yeah. 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 
<laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, I think, and I hear more of this language around, and I, I, I like it because I think, um, I think there's a lot of truth to this idea of, you know, maybe there's not something you can do about a particular circumstance, but the, you can start looking at the system. Mm -hmm. The system transcends individuals and individual circumstances. Um, but if you're not really knocking that down or changing it in any way, then you end up perhaps with the same problems over and over again. Um, right. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe there's, that's what justice is. I, I don't know, but, um, I mean, I think a lot of people, the word justice itself means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. You know, it's, it, it's sometimes there's a semantics problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, uh, I think, you know, in, in the broader. Well, I think it's an all in one answer. I think it's a word people use as in justice. It, 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 it represents the punishment, you know, the person getting caught, the, the uh, re resolution for the victims and their families and stuff like it's this all in one just add water and it's done type thing. Right. It's, just, and it's just not that simple. It just, it just isn't. That's all. Yeah, I agree. But what do I know? You know, <laughs> so with this book, so what, what does one of these books do for you? Like, so you, you know, cause you put so much into it and it's so important and it yeah. comes out and, and now you've got, you know, you you read some reviews and you're happy they're getting it. You know, people are getting what you're trying to, trying to put down you know and and uh so what does this do for you do you think i think well i mean there's the obvious answer of of it pays my bills right oh, right, right that it, contract thing <laughs> yeah right i mean i am i am both a practical and a creative the 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 bigger answer and i think what you're asking about is for me it creates coherence and I think when we tell our stories, even if they're fiction, or maybe especially if they're fiction, we take these sort of disparate pieces and we make a coherent narrative. I think, do you, did the two of you ever play Tetris? Yes. Yep. Right. And so it's like that where all these disjointed pieces drop down, but if you create coherence, that layer disappears and you're lighter, you're freer. And putting it out in the world, I get, I get coherence and I get to not have to carry around things that I am so used to carrying around that I didn't even notice until they were gone. So you can let go of it. Exactly. It's like embodying emotion or embodying trauma. So you don't just have to live inside and live, you know, it's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I think it's, I think it's resonating with people. I think that's what good books do is they, uh, they, I, I know the books that I love, I connect with them and they resonate with me. And then I get to, even if I haven't written it, I get to see that I'm not alone and release a little bit of something. So basically it's um, moving on after you're, after you've murdered these people, you can, <laughs> it's your way of working through it and then moving on. You can let go of it now. Yeah. Yes. And also feel like I um, am more connected. Cause I think that's, I think that's what we all want to be more connected to something to each other, but also to something uh, bigger than us. So do you think there is, um, so that's, you know, we've been talking kind of on the thematic level, but do you think that there's something to actually fitting a novel together? Like you're talking about disparate pieces falling down, you know, but also just the actual act of figuring out a plot and figuring out like how to balance character development, all that. Do you think that's part of the process? I do. I think it's, um, it's this, delicious puzzle which is completely engrossing and once you finally get once you finally get all those pieces in place I don't, it's a really good it's a really good job if you can get it right <laughs> i think it's something that we all must enjoy to a degree or we wouldn't be writing maybe there's a relation i think i don't know i'm talking from my perspective but the act of puzzle that part of it it leads to the other part like i don't always see what i'm after until i've worked out the logistics <laughs> like somehow like one opens the other for me and um and sometimes i'll have like very late stage you know aha moments or revelations about what i was after all along when i'm when i'm writing something um right yeah, yeah. it was just i love it that's the coolest thing ever <laughs> that's my favorite it is it's like a gift that you didn't even know you were getting i, I would imagine it's kind of in a sense you have a a, a a meaning or a subtext or something that comes out in the book that's under the story 
that uh, sometimes it just comes organically. Mm -hmm. Well, and to piggyback off of what John said, sometimes I'll even have written the book, published the book, and I'll be in an interview and somebody will say, you know, I really enjoyed this theme in your novel. And I'm like, what? That's great. I didn't even know that was there. <laughs> but it's really, it's something that that speaks to me. I mean, as English teachers, I always thought sort of made that stuff up. Like, what's the theme of this, right. what's the theme of this book? But there's something to it. What's so funny when you're, we're teaching kids, they're always like, they're really cynical. Not all, you know, I teach high school or had for many years. I don't know. But they're, they're t they tend to be a little bit cynical about like the whole literary analysis, you know, pick out the theme, that kind of stuff. And I always laugh at this. They're like, that writer didn't really mean to put all that in there. I'm like, <laughs> well, yes. And um, it doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> yes. Yes, and now that we're writers, we know that's the truth. you got to be careful, but, you know, someone's going to read something into it and show up at your door. Yeah. You know? What? Like that was, <laughs> yeah, it was like, you know, just, I saw that old um, documentary with John Lennon and that, and that, that hippie shows up at his house and starts telling him things that he read in lyrics. Oh. And it was like, well, that means we're supposed to do this, right, man? I don't need something else to worry about, Al. <laughs> No, that's what I'm here for. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here to, to do this. I'm here to make. See, I'm here to get you on to the next level. The next of fear. Book, the next contract of fear. <laughs> Saw fifty-eight. Yeah. yeah. At the end of the day, what do you think a good book is for you? Yeah, at the that I've written or that I've read or both. Does it not matter? It could be. It could be either. Like, is there is there a certain thing that that you consider to be a good book it, without even titles? It's just like you've read it and you go, "Man, that is really good." Or you've written it and you go, "This is good. I love it." Yeah. You know, like, what is it? Is it, is it the grammar, the 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 the, the theme, the line sentencing? Like, what what exactly about it? makes it happen you know for me it's a feeling which by definition is just so vague but it's one of those books where when you're not after you start it when you're not reading it you're thinking about it and like like it's a lover and you can't wait to get back to it coupled with just really amazing sentences that that don't snag you in that there's they stand out from everything but they're just so beautiful that you go back and reread them over and over again it's like a lullaby and there's a couple writers who i who i know are just going to do that for me like isabel allende i just when i when i start reading one of her books it's like a relationship and then i know she's going to have some of those gorgeous sentences in there so yeah a mixture of of how i feel and then just some really elegant writing it's not it's funny because you know we're crime writers and and crime writers are very crime is very plot heavy but that's not for me, that's not what sticks with me with the book. Yeah, I would say, I would say the same thing. I mean, I, I think that other people would focus on plot, but I, I would have a similar. I think it's a, a, a voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Geez, gee, for me, it's a, the best amount of money I've made. <laughs> 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 but that's the best book. That makes a book good. Yeah. Wow. There you go. See, you know, come on. It's all about. <laughs> So where did where did writing come from for you? Like was it was it something you started doing when you were really young and you've always been doing it, or did it just all of a sudden appear one day? It was you know I I come from a creative family and so it's uh, my dad's a potter, uh, my mother's an English teacher who also was a uh, sews was a seamstress, my sister is a chiropractor, but was also a phenomenal painter. And if you just go back generations, my family's very creative. Creativity is, is valued. And so I didn't know what my place was, but I loved reading. And so I snuck into writing. I got good grades in high school in English, and I thought, I can do this. And so my very first master's thesis was a novel, and it was I thought it was amazing. I wrote it. I finished it in 96. I thought it was incredible. Um, I put it out on submission and I got 25 rejections. And I was like, I'm taking my soccer ball and going home. I'm, I'm never going to write again. <laughs> and it's funny because 
a master's thesis lives in the library, right? It's every, all of our theses are in the libraries where we graduated. And after my first book was published, I went back there to read it. And it is so bad. It is, oh my God, it's embarrassing. It's things like, my dialogue tags were things like, she rubbed her chocolate brown eye, her, her chocolate brown eyes thinking, why doesn't my father love me? <laughs> it was just so bad. It was so bad that I stole it, that I stole it out of the library. But I was also teaching uh, English at a nearby college, and so I was overcome by guilt, and I returned it. But I, for 48 hours, I had stolen that awful, awful thesis. But so that was my, that was, that was it. That was my, going to be my, I tried it. I tried writing. It wasn't for me. Uh, at the time, I was like, it's because everybody else doesn't understand how great I am. Looking back, it was because it was awful. But I, but I, but I, I wasn't going to do it anymore. And so I got another job teaching. I was, uh, I was newly married. I was pregnant. And uh, trigger warning, I'm going to talk about suicide. It was a 9-11. My husband committed suicide. And my, uh, I was three months pregnant with my son, who's a 20-year-old. He's fine. He's healthy. He's wonderful. But the stress of my husband committing suicide put me in the hospital. They thought I was going to miscarry. And so I was, I was hospitalized. I had no, I couldn't escape my body, but just because for obvious reasons, but also because I was creating a human. And my therapist at the time said, you need to journal. You absolutely have to get back into writing, just journal. And I don't believe in journaling. I tell my, I tell my students to do it. I tell my workshop participants to do it, but it seems very self-indulgent to just write words that you're going to put in a book and tuck away. So I decided to start writing a book again. And so my master's thesis was, I'd call it mainstream fiction, women's fiction. I started to write a mystery after my husband committed suicide. And I, at, looking back, it makes so much sense. But at the time I thought, this is all I can focus on right now. I need to something with a plot that I know it's tied up at the end. I know we have answers at the end. I know there's, to use this word again, I know there's some form of justice in here. Uh, I'm just going to write one of those. And so I wrote my first book that was published. It was called Mayday. It was a humorous mystery. Uh, but once I saw how it could help me to survive, and I, I mean, that sounds really sort of overwrought, but at the time it really was to help me survive. I, I, I was hooked. I never looked back. Was that in itself the event that gave you let's say the um the 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 push to to actually try and publish it i think so because that one i was rejected 423 times before i found an agent for mayday and i think if i hadn't just been treading water and that was my life raft i would have i would have given up i mean that's a ridiculous amount of Rejections. What else would you be rejected at that many times and not think this isn't for me? <laughs> <laughs> so I do. I think that was. I think that was the push. That's interesting. Now that you know, um, four hundred and twenty-three. So you've taken note. Did you go back and go after each one of those four hundred and twenty-three people and <laughs> and do something to them? Is this or is this <laughs> sort of one of these missing people sort of thing? Are you, you trying know? to get the plot ideas? <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying. To, well, I'm trying to figure out 423. Mm. I know it was so many, and this was back. So it would have been what? That would have been 2002 or three. And at that time, I was in the country with dial-up internet and a dot matrix printer. Do you remember <laughs> dot matrix printers? And so, I, so I'm at home printing out these query letters on my because I don't have internet that can send email. It's just not powerful enough. So I'm dot matrix printing. 423 query letters and I just sent out 50 at a time with the mindset that well if I get one rejection that's 49 others who might pick it up and after you know 40 rejections I'd send out another 50 and so I think a lot of them it made a my first published book it has good bones but it's not it's not a great book right I mean it's better than my master's thesis but it's I can see why they rejected it. I hold no ill will <laughs> toward anybody who said no to that one. And I'm grateful it got published because it got my foot in the door. It gave me positive reinforcement, which I needed to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Um, so I, I, I guess you're probably like every other author as you write more, 
if you go back to earlier work, you realize or you look at it and you probably would prefer to change some of it now. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got the rights back to my uh, first 12 books because they just, I mean, the first one came out in 2006, they were out of print. And I thought I'm going to just use everything I've learned since edit these and indie publish them. And I started reading it and I couldn't even, I couldn't even bear to read it. I just, I just, I just slapped on new covers and stuck it back. (laughs) 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 It just held my nose and here you go. World. <laughs> Take this. Yeah. <laughs> There's some justice for you. <laughs> I can see it now. My Do, God. Do you have, have a moment when you felt like, you know, um, I don't know, where you became more aware of what you needed to do to become a better writer? Like, I think, I think it's a truth that we're always trying to do that, but I was just wondering, because it feels like for you, there was a there was sort of a moment, or was it more of an evolution, or was there a book you read or a writer you read that changed you like that? Yeah, you know, I agree with you that it's it's an ongoing evolution. That as writers, we're always hopefully trying to improve, and it, and in fact, I think that's one of the draws of writing is that I don't think any of us ever thinks we're good or that we've learned enough. But there was with unspeakable things. It um, it was it, it should never by any rights have sold to anybody. It's about a 12-year-old girl in an abusive home in a town where boys are getting abducted and abused in a flyover state, right? It never should have um, been picked up. But Jessica Tribble at Thomas & Mercer picked it up, and it's in three years sold over 300,000 copies. And it, it made me, it, it was, it. I don't think that, I think I'm a good writer, but I thought I might have stories that people want to hear. And so when Unspeakable Things sold so well, that was the moment where instead of trying to please everybody else with my writing, I would focus some of that toward figuring out what it was that I wanted to say. It's so good. It's such a good book. I, I'm Thank surprised you. you felt that way about it. But yeah, I mean, but sometimes the things that are um, the most kind of personal, you do feel a little more like... They're not going to get accepted. Does that make any sense? (laughs) Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. Because it's so close to the best. It's just something that um, that we don't want to share with the world. And to be fair, it was turned down by every single other editor who looked at it. (laughs) See? Yeah. Well, I think I think that the thing is what we have a difficult time with writers today is because of the internet and because of Amazon and because of the easy access and thousands of books, um, we judge our own writing on what's popular, what's selling, and and things like that, about how many likes we get, how many star rating we have, how many ratings we do get, and things and sales, which is probably the wrong thing to do. We have to separate ourselves from that. Because it doesn't yeah, just because it sells really well doesn't mean it's a good book. Just because it doesn't sell well, again, it, it could it could be a really good book that just didn't make the right have the right cover and have the right publisher and the right you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yes, or the right marketing. I mean, there, like you say, there's there's hundreds of thousands of books out there. It's impossible sometimes to be heard in the noise. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there is, I think you can, you can, sometimes you can even do everything right and still luck, you know, plays a part. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, but, but in a lot of cases, I think it's not just, it's not even just the product. It's how it's broadcast to the world. And likewise, very bad books can get great marketing. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. We, we all know of books that are uh, selling like hotcakes and maybe aren't that great or books that are phenomenal and just aren't getting the attention they need. So what's next? What's going on for Jess now? Yeah, well, so I I have a sort of a police procedural, but it's more of an X-Files police procedural coming out next, I think September 23rd is the date, with Thomas and Mercer. And I lead writing retreats all over the world. And I've taken, I'm halfway through a sabbatical, but I'm right now looking at leading one in Italy next fall and then Costa Rica a year from January. 
Oh my god, that sounds amazing. <laughs> Doesn't that sound fantastic? <laughs> yes. oh, I love it's all the it's all the great parts of teaching with none of the grading. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. I love it. I know. And great locations too. It's not just like, you know, without grading, it's like without grading in Italy. <laughs> in Tuscany, right? right. <laughs> oh, see, this is yeah. how this is how it works. Yeah. And I and I have and I'm breaking into a new genre which I'm excited to talk about. Um probably in a couple of months I'll be able to announce that too. But I have yeah, I have I have a lot of exciting stuff in the works. Thank you for asking. Wow. So now contact. How do people get a hold of Jess? Are you, do you have a website? Do you do social media? Um, are you on well, I mean, hookup apps? Like, what do you? What, how do you connect I'm, with your readers? I'm worried now that you said there's probably a guy waiting outside my front step. Well, if, if not, we will give out your phone number and do it. Do and, it. That's and, such a good idea. Yeah, let's get this out there. No, I, my website is Jessica Lowry. So J E S S I C A L O U R E Y at Oh, no, jessicalowry.com or email jessicalowry at gmail.com. Fantastic. You doing social media or you're not? I do do social media. I Facebook, Twitter, as long as it's still around um, or, or, or not now that, now that they've let somebody back in, but, um, and Instagram. And also I'm putting my toes in the TikTok water, but I don't know about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Come on, have fun. Get on TikTok and start dancing. Get on yeah yeah just just start throwing your book around and dancing and get a dog and yeah. what it made that's all okay i'm gonna do it and i'm gonna send it to you and i'm gonna say is this what you meant yeah <laughs> and get, get john to sing something in the background okay you know Date. i don't know he can just he can sing christmas songs it's close to that right oh you don't want to hear me sing it is not pretty singing and dancing like anything that takes any kind of physical coordination so it's just out i'm surprised i can type well, don't, worry, don't worry the dog will be howling so loud that they won't hear it they won't hear it <laughs> can i hear anything well it's just you know and so i have to say that being that um the type of writer you are when things over the last couple of years, like when we had, you know, the pandemic and we've had um, the one with the orange hair and we've had all sorts of weird things going on and, you know, stress, people protesting and all this tension in the air the last couple of years. Does that affect you when you're trying to write especially serious fiction? Yeah, I think if anything, it makes it more important that we take that time to be creative i know it does for me but i think it's true for everybody to find that quiet time even if it's just sitting on your couch right and just it doesn't even have to be formal meditation just some time away from the noise and so it took me it took me a little while especially in, in minneapolis which is where i live and we had quite a few protests which were um important and necessary but it was you know outside my window and so it took it took a while to get my routine but I I was driven by and, and I've been talking about that this whole interview but I was driven by the the mental health aspect of, of writing and so I was able to find a routine I still procrastinate like a monkey but <laughs> but I do have something like a routine hmm well and and um yeah, it's strange because I just wonder how how much it gets into the writing, do you know? Yeah. Especially when you're under the contract and you're under a deadline or you've got when a I... date and you're writing and yeah. and things are stressful. I wonder if it gets a little darker in your writing. Oh, that is interesting. My writing has gotten darker. Uh as the times get darker, but I think that's true of most writers even if the times don't get dark. I think the more we go on, the more we tackle some of the darker stuff. I think that's why crime fiction is one of my favorite genres, because we can really talk about stuff that matters. And we can do it in an entertaining way. I don't mean light or fun. I mean a way that really grips people. And I think it's important that we do incorporate what is going on into the world into our books. Yeah, yeah, I think it is too. I just wonder how much we'll get in that we don't realize. Yeah, I think that's something that we'll have to have the anthropologists tell us 50 years from <laughs> well, now. <there> is. <laughs> well, no, I just wonder if you look back 10 years from now and you read something that you're writing right now, even the Quarry Girls, and um, you read it then, 
I wonder if if you would notice certain certain motives, certain things that you wouldn't have normally written. You know, I did a uh, I did a soft deep dive into this was about two years ago, and I was going to give a presentation on what sells, what is selling, and of course it's a crystal ball. We're all guessing, but I did a deep dive into what was selling in the late 60s, so 1968, where in the United States we had the Vietnam War, we had uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, followed by Robert Kennedy being assassinated, and it was riots, protests all across the United States. And I was very curious um, what sort of, what books sell when people are just, either they need to escape or they need almost like that homeopathic, more of what they're dealing with in controllable doses so they can, so they can, adjust to it and it was interesting what really came up was a lot of horror and a lot of horror was doing really well so people were sort of turning more toward the darkness which sociologically is interesting to me so i think you're right i think a lot of what we're dealing with now will show is showing up in ways that we can't even recognize because we're swimming in it i've been really interested in my students writing and what they want to write Mm -hmm. about and it's yeah it's like down, it's like horror fiction or wow. like sci-fi fantasy mm. and a little escapism right? yeah i think living creating worlds that are not no one really none of these none of my students really want to write realism and even when they do it is like quite realism it's mm. sort of heightened in some way um yeah that makes so much sense to me well yeah i just i, I i've I've written a book with uh, Peter Vronsky, who's a doctor and teaches history in U of T, University of Toronto, and I know that a lot of his theories, he talks about serial killers of the 60s and 70s, about how they were, he, he ties it to the relationship of World War II mm-hmm. and the way the, the parents, that the fathers that came home and how they treated their, their, their boys, their sons, how they didn't touch them. Um, there, it just, it just, it was really interesting to hear that. So I just wonder if there's a lot of stuff that we do over stressful times, like the pandemic and all the other stuff that we don't realize. And as this generation grows up, where will they be? Yeah. I actually quoted that Peter Bronski, that exactly what you just talked about in the Quarry Girls, uh, author's note, because it's just fascinating to me how cultural forces, of course, shape uh, shape the next generation in ways that we do not know until the check comes due. Right. Yeah. 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 He's, he's been a very good, uh, inspiration for me. Good friend over years. Uh, oh. nice guy. I was really lucky to really come across him. Yeah. He helped me write my, actually my very first book. It was the second one published, but he helped me write it. So he's a co-writer. So there you go. Nice. Full circle. Small nice. world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been a thrill. I'm glad you had the time to come on our, our little um, show. And it was an honor to be invited. I've absolutely enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Well, and thank you. You know, now the book people need to pick up because she needs to get paid. Right. Um, <laughs> the Quarry Girls, and it's a thriller. And Jess Lowry, she's the uh, writer and our guest. And, you know, she needs, she needs Christmas money. So, thank, thank you for being on the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, John. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is the production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.